Hello and welcome to News Click. I'm Poranjoy Goha Thakurta and I'm sitting at the residence of the former finance minister and external affairs minister of India, Yashwan Sinhaji. Thank you, Yashwan Sinhaji, for giving us your time. And it's not been very long, the 21st of April, on your older son Jan's birthday, you decided to quit a political party with which you have been associated for about three decades. And you said you don't want to have anything more to do with the Bharati Janta Party. You've launched a front called the Rashtriya Manch. And you're saying you not only are you going to join any political party, you will not accept any post. Now, why did you choose this specific occasion to quit a political party with which you have been associated, correct me if I'm wrong, since the late 80s, soon after you left the Indian Administrative Service and joined politics in 1986. I joined politics, just a factual correction, in uh, 1984, end of 1984, but I joined the Janta Party of Mr. Chandrasekhar at that point of time. It was after some years in 1993 that I joined the Bharatiya Janata Party. So it has been an association of over two and a half decades. Uh, my longest political association with any political party in my career has been with the Bharatiya Janata Party. <clears throat> so it was heart-wrenching to, to tell you quite frankly. I chose 21st uh, April not because it was Jan's birthday <laughs> so much, but because uh, we had planned a program in Patna and it was a Rasht Manch program, national forum that I set up in January. It was a program of that uh, organization or association. And um, <clears throat> I had been thinking about this for quite some time. You know, you're aware of the fact that I have uh, been critical of the government. I'm on, aware of that. I'm going yeah. to ask you a few questions. Yes, on, on a number of issues. Uh, but when I found that there was no response, then I made up my mind that there was no point in continuing this sterile association. You know, sir, if, I'm, if I can uh, interrupt you, you have been a critic of the present government for quite some time. What I'm trying to find out is what really made you realize on the 21st of April or soon before that, that to use your words, democracy was in danger under the Narendra Modi government, that somehow the government had so undermined democratic institutions in the country that you felt that its restoration would be a long, long time. So you didn't want to be associated with a party with which your son is associated, who continues to remain a minister of state for civil aviation. Yes. Um, no, it is, it is, let me tell you, the first... Um, uh, feeling that uh, things were not all right within the Bharati Janata Party came from friends that I met across the board, members of parliament, even ministers, others. And uh, I realized that there was within the party a very strong sense of fear. People were scared. They were scared to talk to me. They were scared to talk about what was happening. And, um, you know, that gave me, members of parliament told me that in our time, when I was a member of parliament, we had free exchange of views in our parliamentary party meetings. They said it has become one-sided. They speak, we listen. We don't get opportunity to put our point of view or our problems before the leadership. Uh, you know, Nana Patole, who was the... MP from Maharashtra, he left because he did he not You openly get, said that yeah. uh, my, my views are not being listened to. He, is, he was not being listened to. So, you know, some people have taken the ex extremist step, but others are leading a life of fear within the Bharti. In fact, on the 27th of September 2017 in the Indian Express, uh, the article that they titled, I need to speak up now. You said you'll be failing in your national duty if you do not speak up now. And, and you said that you are convinced that what you're saying reflects the views or the sentiments of a large number of people in the BJP who are not speaking up because of yeah. fear. Yeah. You think so that th this atmosphere of fear is continuing? Is continuing. And I tested it for the first time when I wrote that article in the Indian Express last September. 
And then more recently, before I left the party, you'll recall that I had written an open letter to BJP MPs and especially requested senior most leaders like Advani ji and Murli Manohar Joshi ji to do something about the prevailing uh, atmosphere of fear. But again, there was no response. And then, in the meanwhile, Patna was coming up on the 21st of April. And therefore, I decided that there is no point in appealing to people within the party. They will perhaps not have the courage just now. So I must appeal to a wider audience, must appeal to the people of the country. This is one part. The second most important part of this is that all the institutions of democracy in our country are under threat. They are, uh, their effectiveness is being eroded. And that is something which bothers me, you know. So just to name parliament, Supreme Court, Election Commission, media, Reserve, Bank of, India. Reserve Bank of India, agencies, investigating agencies of the government. Okay. You name them and all they right. are all being compromised. So, so let's talk about these yeah. in a little while from now. But since you mentioned the name of Shri L.K. Advani, Dr. Murli Manohar Joshi, there's also Shanta Kumarji. There have been many others, including Mr. Arun Shuri, Govindacharya. And in fact, sometimes you are described as the angry old men of the BJP. Uh, and, and everybody says you have a personal grounds. I remember you even said that, do people stop thinking when you're 70? Uh, the whole idea was that it was suggested when your son became the Minister of State for Finance that, you know, Mr. Modi didn't like, you know, this familial uh, connection because he was very critical of the Gandhi Nehru family. So he said, if your son Janji has been made a minister, minister of state for finance, why should you also aspire for a post? And throughout the narrative has been, Yashwan Sinha is unhappy because he hasn't been given a job. All kinds of suggestions were made that there was a BRICS bank, you were thinking of the BRICS bank. And if you recall after uh, the Indian Express article of the 27th of September, soon thereafter, Mr. Arun Jaitley, the finance minister, sarcastically without mentioning your name, said there are people who have become a job applicant at 80. So it has been painted out that you have a personal grouse. And that's why all your anger is a, that of a personal nature against the present government. I mean, this question must be answered. I have answered it in the past. But I'd like to answer it because you have asked me this question. Uh, in 2014, when the Lok Sabha elections were taking place, I personally decided that I will not contest that election. Okay? You go and ask anyone, senior leader of the party, and I told everyone that I would not be contesting the Lok Sabha elections <coughs> because I wanted to opt out of this kind of electoral politics. So they gave the uh, nomination to my son who contested and won. And from Hazari Bagh. From Hazari Bagh and uh, uh, became a minister of state in the government. Now I knew quite well, even at that point of time, that there can't be two people in government from the same family. And I opted out. I did not contest the elections. Therefore, when I did not contest the election, it was quite clear to me, as it should have been to the others, that I was not aspiring for any post. Okay? But, you know, not aspiring for any post is not the same thing as not getting some respect from the government or the party to which I had belonged. Huh? And even uh, Mr. Modi, when he took over as Prime Minister, he had, I must say to his credit, invited me to a meeting in which we discussed the replacement of the Planning Commission with Niti Aayog. Why did he invite me? I was not a member of the government, but he thought that maybe I had something to say on, the, on a subject like this. After that, I wrote him letters. After that, I uh, I made suggestions to the government on a number of issues because, as you recalled, becoming, attaining the age of 75 does not mean that you have stopped thinking. So I thought about things, especially about national issues, and I wanted to tell the government about some of those issues. But that opportunity was denied to me, and it was said as if 
what is it that they could do to me? They, they can't bring, and I am saying it with a challenge, they will not be able to bring charges of corruption against me. Nobody has brought charges of corruption there against me. There have been controversies, we can no, talk about those. No, no, the, forget the controversies. A controversy can be raised by vested interests about you, me, anybody. But because that is closed, therefore what else, what, what other charge can there be? That other charge can be that I am interested in a job opportunity, I am looking for a job. As Arun Jaitley said, I have replied to that. I am not interested and that's why in Patna I made it very clear that I will not join another political party and that I am not a claimant for any job in future. Now what could be more straightforward than this? All right. And how can this chart then stand against me? Yashwan Sinaji, you have been very critical of the government as you've said. You've described uh, the present government as a one-man show run by the Prime Minister, Mr. Narendra Modi. You've gone to the extent of suggesting that the current atmosphere of fear that is prevailing is worse than that what that was prevailing during the emergency in the mid-70s when Indira Gandhi was the Prime Minister of India. You've gone to the extent of suggesting that even there's been some sort of a surveillance operation taking place with even attempts to, you know, uh, put in chips in, in set-top boxes. Uh, are you not overreacting that this government is sort of uh, scared everybody and spying on everybody, conducting some sort of mass surveillance operations. And isn't the analogy with the Indira Gandhi's emergency a bit stretched that, you know, that uh, uh, then the, the civil liberties, the civil rights of the country were completely abridged and, you know, uh, the media was completely censored, barring a few people who protested. How can you compare the situation prevailing in this mid-70s till now to what is happening today? Indira Gandhi's emergency was, to borrow a Hindi phrase, a jhatka operation. Suddenly, one day or one night, it was announced that emergency had been imposed. Many people were put behind bars. and. Uh, restrictions are imposed on a number of uh, institutions, including the media. Now, this is something which everyone felt that here is, you know, emergency which has been imposed. In this case, in the present case, it is slow poison. It's not a jhatka, it's not a sudden operation. It is slow poison which is being injected into the system. Liberties, freedoms are being taken away. And uh, we are not conscious of it because uh, it's not hitting us as much as um, Indira Gandhi's emergency hit us. But I had told you earlier that if you look at any of the institutions of democracy, you will find the very sorry state in which they are. And um, if you give me the time, I'd like to begin with the Parliament of India. Okay, I have spent a lot of time in the Parliament of India. You first became a Rajya Sabha MP in 1988, am I correct? Yes. And almost continuously? Almost continuously in Parliament and thrice in the Lok Sabha, right? Now, what is the most important function of Lok Sabha? The most important function of Lok Sabha is to determine whether the government of the day has majority or not, isn't it? One of the one of the important points. But the most important, I'll say, because right. it's also to enact laws. No, and it's, a, laws. it's a, to do a lot of other All things. Right. Okay. But the most important constitutional responsibility of the Lok Sabha is to determine the majority of the government because once that majority goes, even by one vote, then the government goes. Right. Okay. If you remember April 1999, Atal yes. Bihari Vajpayee's government, one vote. Yeah. One vote. So that is, the, that is the strength, that is the power, that is the majesty of democracy. And this time you have a government who is not even willing to admit a confidence a low, motion. A no-confidence motion filed by a number of parties in the opposition was not allowed to come up. And every day the speaker will get up and just say, I can't count 50 people and therefore I am unable to admit the motion. Then why should there be a Lok Sabha? Because it failed to perform. In the din, she got the budget passed, including the finance bill, with very important amendments. 
but she could not count 50 people because it was being deliberately disrupted. Parliament was being, Lok Sabha was being deliberately disrupted by the ruling party people. Why would they do it? They had because a comfortable majority. They had, but there, there was no issue. Right, I mean, there was no right. question of the government losing a vote of confidence on the floor of the but House. But that's where you are making a mistake, Paranjaji. There would have been a discussion. That's right. In the discussion, a whole host of issues would have been raised. The failures of the government would have been pointed out. The media, despite all the curbs, would have carried some of it. It would have reached the people of the country that this is how the government is functioning. They did not want that discussion. I don't believe in rumors that some MPs of the BJP would have voted against the government. But the government would certainly have been criticized severely by the opposition. Even though the opposition is weak? Even though the opposition is weak and even though the government would have one majority. But where does it say in the rules of Lok Sabha that a vote of confidence, no confidence, can be brought only when you have a majority to prove that the government does not have a majority? Where does it say that? So, Lok Sabha has not been allowed by the government to perform its most important constitutional responsibility. I, I, I stop you here. There, we will discuss this. I mean, uh, there are a number of things to discuss. Let me take on one issue, and because it is topical. And that is this whole issue of, don't call it corruption, call it sweetheart deals. I want your opinion on what you think the media reports concerning the Minister for Railways, Mr. Piyush Goel and his wife. Now, we've recently had a rejoinder coming in from the Piramal group and because it has been alleged in that article that there was some sort of a quote-unquote sweetheart deal between the two and the Piramal group has said there's no conflict of interest and on issues of valuation there can be a dispute. But the more important question is why is it that Mr. Piyush Goel did not disclose these facts and the, the, the transactions and the sales of these assets and com uh, of, of the companies where he and his wife are, are controlling these firms to the public at large, you know the Prime Minister uh, is has made it clear that all the ministers have to disclose their assets. The ele Election Commission of India has certain rules about affidavits. What are your views on the recent controversy about My Mr. view Piyush? is very clear. And it's not only about Piyush Goel case. It's about a number of other things, other cases also. You know, some facts come to the notice or come into the public domain. They raise a doubt. Now, the, the policy of the government has been that if it is going to be inconvenient, the truth coming out is going to be inconvenient, then let's kill it at that stage itself so that truth does not come out. And I'm sorry to say that where there has been very strong prima facie reasons for a further inquiry or investigation, they have been stopped. The government just says no. It's no, not there. No, I, I recall when uh, your son's name appeared in the, the uh, Paradise Papers, mm -hmm. you said that please investigate yes. his involvement. Just like you said, if the son of the Bharatiya Janata Party president, uh, Mr. Amit Shah, his son, Mr. Jay Shah, if their companies have done something which is irregular or illegal, that should be investigated. It was Am never investigated. Jay Shah's case. But it was not alleged that there was any corrupt practice. It was merely what you might call a sweetheart deal where the, the, his company's business is suddenly shot up in a little time. And then closed. <laughs> that, that's it's, what the official record seemed yeah, to suggest. Then, then, you know, it burst into flames and, and, and uh, closed. No, the point I'm making it in his case, as in Jan Sinha's case, if anybody felt that there was a case for further inquiry, in Justice Loya's case, if there was a case for further inquiry. In Piyush Goel's case, you think that facts would suggest, prima facie, that there should be an inquiry. Why are we running away from that inquiry? Why can't we have an inquiry or an investigation and bring out all the facts in public domain? And then let the public decide whether there was conflict Why of do you interest. Think so? Why is the government... Because government is, government is trying to conceal 
something which will cause embarrassment to the government. You mentioned justice. It's as as clear as that. You mentioned justice lawyer, but before I come to the justice lawyer and the controversies relating to the Supreme Court of India, while you were writing, uh, you wrote an article in NDTV on the 20th of February, where you laid out. You asked for about ten questions from the government on the scandal on the, the the scandal in the Punjab National Bank pertaining to companies controlled by Mr. Nirav Modi and his uncle Mr. Mehul Choksi. Now, you have there pointed out that when you were the finance minister, there were Ketan Parikh scam, and when Dr. Manmohan Singh was the finance minister, there was a Harshad Mehta scam, and both of you appeared before the Joint Parliamentary Committee. to explain your position you you also in your own uh, biography which i read and reviewed you yourself described the uh, the the scandal pertaining to the unit trust of india uh, as something that you know you feel you you are regretful that you uh, acted in the way you did i i'll read out the exact sentence the whole uti affair is a very sorry chapter of my tenure as finance minister and you conceded that you made a mistake in not cancelling a meeting you had with which mr vajpai so i'm saying here in the case of the uh, nirav modi scandal do you think also the government is deliberately suppressing information it 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 finds out how quickly uh, the valuation of the goods that have been seized but it's not mentioning whether the letters of undertaking which year when it went uh, a lot of information is not being disclosed the most important question there is how did he run away from the country how did nirav modi how was he allowed to leave india how did he get photographed in that hall of fame photograph in the davos meeting in the davos meeting with the prime minister you know because these things uh, don't happen uh, in a jiffy they build up over a period of time and his scandal was building up over a period of time mehul choksi nirav modi and uh, then he runs away from the country after some time we'll forget about it because some police investigation will take place and let me tell you here and now that i have lost faith in even cbi inquiries so you think the same story with mr lalit modi mr vijay malya is going to be repeated it has been repeated it Mira has modi been repeated and others there would there could have been i would have demanded a a joint parliamentary committee inquiry but after the 2g joint parliamentary committee unfortunately i have lost faith in the jpc system also but when uh, the uh, harshad mehta scam took place we had a congress chairman of the jpc i know mr ramnivas mirza and he was a gentleman to the core and we were in the opposition and he allowed us not only to ask any question that we wanted to you ask you grilled those people yes but also asked us to write various chapters of the report where he yes. thought that we had uh, more mm -hmm. knowledge and expertise no no but is that happening now no but why are you holding the finance minister responsible i i read out from your article you said it is not possible for any finance minister to personally supervise the day to day functioning of every organization and institution under his control which includes a whole host of organizations yet under our parliamentary system the ultimate responsibility will rest with the minister who is responsible for that ministry so the finance minister cannot be absolved of his constitutional and democratic responsibility uh, are you being fair to mr jaitley let me explain you mentioned uti uh, crisis which took place 2001 yeah did we have did the government of india have a representative on the board of the uti no we had nothing to do apart from the fact that lic and certain other public sector public of... sector institutions had share holdings in the uh, uti the government had nothing to do with the uti absolutely nothing in chidambaram's time uti had been released from all there controls were, there were two separate from, organizations from from the from the uh, government now i was held responsible for whatever happened in the uti there was an adjournment motion on that issue in parliament wasn't it yes there was so if i can be responsible for ketan parekh or uti or manmohan singh for harshad mehta how can jaitley not be held responsible constitutionally and morally and legally for what happened with the punjab national bank which is a public sector bank therefore we have to make a distinction between the day to day functioning of an institution organization 
within the ministry and the overall constitutional and moral responsibility for that. Who is responsible to parliament? The finance minister. Who takes complete responsibility? The finance minister. So parliament has to hold the government generally and gently in particular as responsible. Okay. Now, Mr. Sinha, you know, the whole, when you have been critical of the government, the issues have been muddied again and again by personalizing the issues. For instance, when you wrote that article in the Indian Express in September 2017, the response came from your son. You had made a series of remarks about what you felt was mismanagement of the economic affairs of the country by Mr. Jaitley, the finance minister. The response came from your son, Jain Sina. So you are being said that you are at best being hypocritical. Your own son is very much a part of the government. And yes, of course, he is uh, uh, an independent person. So what if he's your son? He's educated. He's studied in eminent ed or, or well-known educational institutions, uh, Indian Institute of Technology, Delhi, uh, High Harvard Business School. He's held important positions. But this whole attempt that your son is made to refute the... I'll tell you why. Yeah. I'll tell you why. First of all, that article which I wrote in the Indian Express, uh, created ripples which were quite unexpected. Even I did not expect that uh, you know it will cause that kind of uh, uh, waves in the system. But it did for whatever reason. Must because must be because it touched a chord somewhere. The other is that after that the the, the uh, success of that article. Let's put it that way. The government adopted a two pronged strategy to counter it. One was to reduce it to the level of a father-son duel, a debate between a father and a son. So Jain Sina wrote that piece and uh, everybody, you even today you are asking me, Jain wrote that piece and um, you know he's your own son and how do you explain it? Number two, they tried to, they tried to trivialize it by gently making that personal allegation that, that I am you were a job, job applicant, applicant at 80. 80. Apropos nothing. There was no provocation in that function for him to say that. But he said it. Because he wanted to trivialize the whole thing. My contention all along and even today is, please reply to the issues that I have raised. Yeah, you've raised a whole set of issues again, demonetization, yeah. Yeah, please goods reply. and services please, tax, please, job please, creation, yeah. agrarian please, crisis. Please, please, please right reply right. to those issues. Why make it a father and son debate? Okay. Why make it a personal uh, debate between Arun Jaitley and me? No, I am not interested in that. And I must tell you that because of the reply that I gave on both counts, that, uh, that attempt of the government did not succeed. And people did not believe that it was a father-son father debate only or that I was really looking for a job. I want to take you a little bit back in time and then come back to the present. You know, it is said that after you worked with the Indian Administrative Service, the IAS, for about 24 years, and then subsequently you joined politics, you were at that point of time fairly close with, among other politicians, uh, Karpuri Thakurji, and, and that there were certain socialist leanings in you, and that you were at times not so happy with the Ayodhya movement, that your relationship with L.K. Advani ji has been sort of blow hot, blow cold, love, hate if you like. You were critical of his visit uh, to Pakistan and some of the points he made. But now you're seen as the same side, also critical sometimes thing. I want to ask you two points. What is your association with Mr. Advani and why do you think Mr. Advani has not publicly endorsed the points that you've made? And secondly, I want you to talk about the second part of the question is the, the allegation by the opposition that our society has become excessively communalized. The Hindu-Muslim divide has wor worsened for a variety of reasons including cow, the whole cow slaughter business, garbapsi, etc. And, and you yourself, I think you were arrested briefly in Hazaribagh on April 2007 for holding a religious procession. I'm linking up many things, sir. We start with Mr. Advani and then the communal issue. You know, I worked with Karpuri Thakur as a civil servant. Then I joined the Janta Party, which was headed by Mr. Chandrasekhar. He was another socialist. 
as a civil servant, I did not have an ideology. And that's a point which I've made very clear from time to time. I studied socialism as part of my... You were a teacher career. of political science? Yes. So it's not that I'm unaware of the philosophies, political philosophies, whether of socialism or communism or market economy or whatever. But as a civil servant, I did not have a pronounced ideological leaning. One should not have, and I also did not have. But because of my association with Karpuri Thakur and with Chandrasekhar, it was assumed that I had a socialist leaning, and I am not going to contradict that. Yes, I believe in socialism, I believe in equality of opportunity, um, and I believe in uh, a, a society which, which, is, uh, which takes everyone along. Inclusive. Inclusive society. That is, uh, I have absolutely no problem with. Uh, I was critical of the demolition of the Babri Masjid. There is a speech of mine in Parliament in Raj Sabha, which is often quoted, which was not very uh, praising, which was not praiseworthy of uh, praising the BJP. Including Mr. Advani in particular. Yeah. But the point I'm making is, when I joined the Bharati Janata Party, Mr. Advani was very, very, very nice to me all along. And um, that enabled me to move from one position of responsibility within the BJP to another. Do you remember? I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm jogging your memory a little bit. In July 2002, when you switched sides with Mr. Jaswant Singh, External Affairs and Finance Portfolio, it was said this was done at the instance of Mr. Uh, L.K. Advani because uh, it was felt that, uh, you know, at that point of time, there were too many controversies. No, you, by, you, by, you are absolutely right. I had told Mr. Advani that if I am moving out of finance and if I don't go to external affairs, which is the only other ministry that I would like to accept, then I'll be out of the government, I'll be a member of parliament. He must have spoken to um, uh, Mr. Vajpayee and it was external affairs where I got shifted. So there is no doubt that Advani played a role and a very important role in that. The only difference that I had with Advani was on not his Pakistan visit, but a certain statement that he made about Jinnah being Jinnah. secular. And I did not agree with that statement because it was, he quoted one of speech of Jinnah and I did not think that that absolved Jinnah of this the... This was during his visit to Pakistan. Yeah, the communal role okay. that he had played in our history. So there was that difference. Okay, but we made up. I met him subsequently, I explained my point of view to him. He explained his point of view to, to me. And the issue was forgotten between him and me. Uh, now, I have always been, and I'm, I'd like to say it, Specifically on record, I have been a great admirer of Advani ji, just as I have been a great admirer of Atal ji in the BJP. These were the two tallest leaders of the party under whom or with whom I had the opportunity of working. And I enjoyed every day of that. So no, why has he not so it supported has not you? Been, no, why no, has he not supported Let me you tell you, you okay. it has not been an uh, off and on hard and soft a relationship with Advani, it has been consistently, except for that Jinnah remark, it has been a consistently cordial relationship that I have enjoyed with Advani ji. To the other question, I will say, yes, during the last four years, the polity has been communalized, much more so than... One minute, sir. Hmm. Mr. Advani also has not endorsed you. Uh, you want you said one of the reasons no. why you left the BJP on the 21st of April was because you did not get any, get any support from within the party. And you mentioned Mr. Advani's name in that context. Yeah, so that's a fact. So he hasn't... He supported. hasn't... He has not criticized me. He has not supported me. Supported you. Okay. Yeah, let's leave now it coming that. to the communalization of Indian society in the recent past. What are your views on that? My, my view is very clearly that... Uh, communalization is taking place. And I'll uh, go back to the old thesis that if there is communalization of the majority community, then in response, there is a greater communalization of the minority communities. And if the reverse is also can also be true, that if the minority community is uh, communalized, 
more than acceptable levels, then there will be a response from the majority community. So this, these forces have been playing. I mean, there are leaders in the Muslim community who are as or even worse communalists than anyone in the Hindu community. No, but when you look at the government today, Mr. Modi has completed four years as the Prime Minister, almost four years. And he talks about Sabka Saath, Sabka Vikas. But do you believe in these last four years, the tensions between Hindus and Muslims in India have widened? Yes. And what you might describe as the majoritarian view, the view that the majority view will always prevail, has become uh, even more uh, magnified, intensified in the yes, recent past. Yes, I'll agree with that. That there has been much greater communalization of the majority community in the last four years. They have become more assertive and the minority community has been at the receiving end of this growing communal feeling among the majority community. Okay. Let me ask you to gaze into your crystal ball a little bit and see where we are going to move this country, is, which direction is going to move in the coming, say, year or thereabouts. We have the Karnataka Assembly elections that are going to take place in, uh, we'll know the outcome by the, on the 15th of May, around the, uh, the 12th of May is when the elections will take place. Would you like to make any comments on how you see the whole campaigning that has been going on in Karnataka in the recent past? I will not only confine myself to Karnataka. You can go back I, to Gujarat. I would say that uh, in recent, in recent uh, yes. elections, whether they are elections for the state assemblies or even by-elections. You are talking about Uttar Pradesh and, and Pur, Rajasthan, Pur, 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 where, wherever, Rajasthan, wherever elections have been, wherever elections have taken place, the discourse has been very coarse. You know, the political level of political discourse should not be reduced to this level. Certainly not by people who are occupying highest positions of responsibility. For instance, in the Gujarat election, you know, talking about Pakistan, talk, um, accusing a former prime minister of being in cahoots with Pakistan, in conspiracy with Pakistan, to defeat the Bharati Janata Party in Gujarat was, I think, absolutely uncalled for on the part of the Prime Minister. So similarly in, uh, in, uh, in Karnatak, the level of discourse has been brought down so considerably that it is not, it's not civilized anymore. That should not be uh, the level and that is not the level to which uh, Vajpayee ever descended to win an election. You know, losing an election is not a sin, but spoiling the discourse, reducing the quality of discourse is a sin. Okay. If you look ahead uh, in the, I'm going to come back to you with a few points on institutions and some of the issues which I haven't been able to touch on, including demonetization. But before, on the issue of politics, in the next 12 months, the standard talk is among certain, in certain circles, is that the opposition is deeply divided. The country doesn't want uh, one more of a ragtag coalition, whether it be of the Janta Party type or the United Front type. And the, uh, the Congress is extremely weak and therefore we are in a situation where the, the opposition can't come together. There are no, personal, there are no tall personalities also. Uh, it is alleged that Mr. Rahul Gandhi, as the leader of the Congress, will not be able to put together that coalition. What are your views? Uh, do you believe, uh, just as once upon a time, anti-Congressism became the glue that uh, ensured that, whether it be the Bharti Jansang or the BJP with the left, with the socialists coming together, the time has now come to form a, a kind of a front where the only common factor is... Uh, anti-BJPism, if you like, or anti-Modiism, if you like. No, first of all, let me tell you, you use the expression, the country does not want. The country would not want. No, I'm, how I'm, I'm saying know? in certain circles no, that no, has been how claimed. How do we know? How do we okay, know what the please. country wants? All right. I mean, for us to sit 12 months before the election and say the country will not want this, country would not want this, to, the, uh, the answer to your question is, if the Janta Party had not won, the 1977 elections, Lok Sabha elections, do you think democracy in this country would have survived? It, the, the government might have fallen apart. 
It may not have survived. It may not have served its full term. But they rendered a historic service to this country by saving its constitution and saving its democracy. And what about 1989? And uh, Vishwanath Pratap Singh. 1989, I would not say that uh, democracy was in danger okay. as it was in 77 or is it today. So it didn't work out. But, you know, that is that apart. The very fact, in, suppose in 2011, in 2012, we were talking, would you have predicted that uh, Mr. Naren Modi will be the prime ministerial candidate of the BJP? None of us were sure. No, because he emerged. Leaders emerge. Leaders are not made. They are not created. They emerge out of circumstances and therefore I don't despair. I don't despair that, oh, opposition will not unite, Congress is leaderless, Rahul Gandhi will not um, carry any conviction that um, they have no program except anti-Modism, anti-BJPism. No. Maybe they'll put together a program. Okay. Maybe they'll have a better program. Would, 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 you, would you work towards putting together such a program? I, I, if given the opportunity, I most certainly will. A, a sort of a common minimum program that we discussed? M more than a common minimum program. We should have a more than a common minimum program. And the, the parties in the opposition, you know, look at the Indian political scene today. There is the Congress party, which is the All India Challenger to BJP. It's the weakest it's ever been, but, historically. But, but it is weak. But then there are regional parties, That's correct. which are dominant parties in their own respective Trinamool states. Trinamool Congress, Biju Janata Dal, uh, yes. DMK, AIDMK, Telangana, Rashtamiti. That's right. So, there are a whole lot of regional political forces. And then there is the Congress party. They'll have to, at some point of time, discuss all these things and uh, come together if they want to. Put up a fight. Would you like to yourself facilitate such a process through the Rashtriya Manch? Let's see. Let's see. I am not uh, uh, making any commitment at this point of time, but I certainly would like to uh, advise political parties in the opposite. Okay. All right. Uh, you know, I want to take a step back. And he, one of the reasons you've talked about, you said, I don't know whether how you would compare that with... Uh, the 70s and Indira Gandhi, you called the present government as a one-man show. Mr. Arun Shuri called it a Dhai Vekti Ka Sarkar. But the centralization of power that we see today, would you say it's unprecedented? And I want to link this to a second part of the question, which is demonetization. But let me start with... No, the, let me answer the first question yes. first. You know, we have been talking about the Gujarat model. What is the Gujarat model? As I have been able to understand it, Gujarat model is the chief minister, the chief minister's office, controlling everything through the bureaucracy, not through the ministers, through the bureaucracy. So the secretary to chief minister will be in touch with the secretary of a department or a ministry, and they'll be working out future programs or whatever has to be done by the government. That Gujarat model has been imported. Didn't Indira Gandhi do something similar? No, she, she did not completely marginalize, marginalize the, the political personalities, you know. So you still had important political personalities even during the emergency. So it was not the Gujarat model. The Gujarat model is now being implemented, has been implemented in Delhi, where the Ministers have become irrelevant. It is the PMO, PM, PMO and the ministry officials who are uh, doing everything. So the PMO is directly in touch with the secretary of the ministry, often uh, without the knowledge of even the minister in charge. Can you give an example? No, I will not like to give examples because they, they, all right, all right. the examples will hurt. But I am sure I have personal knowledge and not necessarily from my son, that they, this is what exactly is happening. And therefore, ministers have been reduced to nil responsibility in this government. This is the pattern. Now, in November of 2016, the sudden, abrupt 
disruptive decision to demonetize 86% of the currency. Would you describe this as a manifestation as of the this most whimsical decision of one it man? It was the the most important, it is the most important example to date of that Gujarat model that I was describing. Was anyone in the cabinet taken into confidence? He went through the motions of a cabinet meeting. No, no, no. That there meeting was a was, Reserve Bank of India. That meeting was held. RBI According to my information, that meeting was held. And he left the meeting in the middle, the Prime Minister, and said, I'll make a speech and come back. And he announced uh, the uh, demonetization measure. As far as RBI is concerned, we have now uh, Raghuram Rajan on record to say that he had opposed it. The new governor did not resist, not only did not resist, but acted as a rubber stamp with his board of governors and uh, approved of this suggestion. So everyone was steamrolled into, uh, into, into accepting this uh, Muhammad bin Tughlaq decision. Tell me, there is speculation that Raghuram Rajan might even head the Central Bank of UK, but let's forget that. Do you believe that the RBI governor and the RBI as an institution has been undermined terribly? And, they, they and, and, and this decision of the GST, and, and we are seeing the impact of GST still happening. The automated teller machines are going dry. This has done a lot of damage to the institution of the central bank, and the is. Apex Monetary Authority. Absolutely. Absolutely. It has done a lot of damage and nobody today believes in the autonomy of the RBI, probably not even the governor. Mm -hmm. About job creation, what are your views? You know, we are getting all kinds of data that is coming up. Different people interpret data in different ways. Uh, they, what comes out from the Employees Provident Fund, what is done by the Labor Bureau. But there is an attempt being made to show that the present government's track record in job creation has not been as bad as the opposition has tried to make it out to be. What are your views? My views are that job uh, data is not a, does not become available anytime soon. You know, it takes it, it has a long lag. Now, having said that, I'll make one general point. You talked about the Labor Bureau. That general point is that if the present system of job data collection does not uh, bring the government to project the government in in a good light then we'll change the system and that's exactly what is going to happen same it way is, as the gross domestic as the gross product, domestic product numbers well, yeah you, you have so said we'll, that because of changing the methodology you artificially inflated that figure by roughly two percent yeah that is one the second is that in our system of collecting data as has been pointed out by a number of economists we don't get or unorganized sector data for almost three years. So you don't have uh, the impact of GST and demonetization on the unorganized sector, which was the worst affected. It's only the corporate sector data, which is suggesting that we are growing at 7.3% or whatever. So that apart, the point I'm making is, as far as jobs are concerned, now the government is referring to the uh, employees provident fund data that is being challenged by people and where you know it must be seen we, we have not referred for instance to the telecom sector I saw a report in the media which said that 80 90,000 jobs are going to be lost in the telecom system, uh, sector alone we know the problems in the IT sector where job creation leave that apart job losses are taking place Sector after sector, Paran Jaiji, of the Indian economy is in dire distress. Isn't it? Construction, which is the biggest employer. What is happening in the construction So what can sector? be done under the circumstances to revive the economy? Because you yourself have said... No, it is not revived. I am saying that 7.3% would perhaps be 4.3%, even less. There is this famous economist called Arun Kumar, a former teacher of the... Jawaharlal Nehru University, who believes that we are going at minus rate, but we are claiming it's 7.3. Okay. If the economy is in such a terrible shape as you and others have made it out to be, 
what is the way forward? I mean, I want you, I mean, since we are running out of time and I've been talking to you for almost one hour, I, I want you to outline what needs to be done. And I go back to how I started. Your Rashtriya Manch and other people who are as critical of the present government as you are, what do you think should be the way forward? A, the youth of this country, they are the suffering the most because of job losses. Half the population of this country is today below the age of 25, 26. We have presumably one more year to go before the next general elections are concerned. What according There's to There is nothing which can be done in this last one year. This government has exhausted all its options and all its opportunities. There is nothing that one can expect from this government. We are already in the electoral mode. After Karnataka, we'll have the other state elections and then the parliament elections. So no major uh, decision uh, is going to be taken, especially in popular decision. And you are aware of the fact that in order to move the economy, at times you have to take unpopular decisions. So they will not do that. So I don't expect anything from this government in the next 12 months. Uh, but what should be done to rev up the economy? There are a lot of things which have to be done. Up, done. I used to say, uh, before uh, this government came into position, as the spokesperson of the Bharatiya Janata Party, before the elections, that we should hit the ground running when we came into government. And attempt because you had the bonanza of low oil prices. Low oil prices, and we should do two things. One is, deal strictly with the problem of bank NPS, and two, you know, clear all the uh, stalled projects. How would the country move forward? if projects are not there. So, clear the stalled projects, which have been held up for various reasons, and deal with bank NPAs. How have we dealt with bank NPAs? With the government will tell you uh, about more than half a dozen initiatives that they have taken. No, but why has then it gone up to 9 lakh crore? They are saying because it's now coming out into the open. No, it is not. It's, it was always there. And if the economy had improved real, really, then the problem would have then would the problem would have been automatically solved. So bank, you think that the 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 rise in the unpaid loans of the banks and most of them are big business houses. Yes, yes. I mean the total amount in about nine lakh crore, which is bad debt, as far as the agricultural sector is concerned, is only sixty thousand crore rupees. Only sixty thousand crore. And why is there a gradient distress? You know, as I said in that letter, if the, we are the fastest growing economy of the world, why are bank NPAs growing year by year, quarter by quarter? Why, why is there a gradient distress? Why is there so much unemployment? Why are sector after sector of the economy failing? So clearly the picture is not what the government would like us to believe. Mr. Sena, you know, last question, positively the last one political funding. You know, when you you have also had your share of people who have been accusing you that you were, didn't play it straight, correct me if I'm wrong, there have been uh, specific uh, allegations leveled against you about the way you your expenditure details to the Rajya Sabha while you were finance minister. I remember your association with an industrialist also came up and you do mention all of these things uh, also. In no, but, but how do I conclude? I, the the, conclu I, the yeah. conclusion is... Has this government no, made no, political but let funding? Me, let, now okay. that you have raised that issue, okay. which is a long settled issue yes. as far as I am concerned, let me clarify that I had reflected all these expenditures in my election return, expenditure return. And that's how I was able to convince parliament. Mm -hmm. But be that as it may, election funding is a very important issue and the government has made it more opaque through these new bearer bond scheme. So, so you are saying you made it public about uh, the posters getting printed by Mr. Ashok Chaturvedi of Flex Industries, his employees staying in your house. All those you said you made public completely. The employee took my this house on rent. Okay. okay. Now? There was no quid pro quo as had been alleged. No, no. What could be the quid pro quo? That he sent me a few uh, uh, pamphlets, printed some election material. Okay. I stood up in Lok Sabha, I stood up in Raj Sabha and said whatever material he supplied has been accounted for in my expenditure return. Mm -hmm. I paid for them right. 
and I explained it to the election commission finished. Okay. But this government, Mr. Jaitley said, I'm going to make uh, the election funding system more transparent. There's the issue of electoral bonds. Then using the money bill, he does retrospective amendments twice to the Foreign Contribution Regulation Act. Has election funding become more transparent? Has no, no, the nexus has, between big business and politics it has not, become it has more not, it open? Has, it has become between big business and the, the government of the day, the political party in power. You know, it has become uh, a much more cozy relationship than it was. It is not transparent. It's transparent only in the sense that government will know everything. Others will not. Okay, I got you. Positively, the last remark I want from you. Would you urge the people of India to vote out this government? Yes, without doubt. Without blinking an eyelid. I'll say when you get the opportunity, please vote out this government. Thank you very much, Mr. Yashwant Sinha, for giving us your time. You've been very patient. You, in you've done a lot questions. of research. I must Thank say. you, sir. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.